Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this Friday, October 14th, 2011 edition of the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Aaron Dyke, sitting in for Alex while he's out on assignment. You heard him today on the radio, and he'll be back next week as well. Coming up on the broadcast, we have activist Rick Warden, who's been occupying the Dallas Federal Reserve for the past week. Then later, we'll speak with Tony Casso, who successfully lobbied Pinellas County, Florida, to remove fluoride. After that, we'll speak with Laura Presley, Ph.D. of Fluoride Free Austin, on tactics to remove fluoride from your local water supply. Tonight in the news, we have more updates on the manufactured terror plot, the alleged assassination plot against the Saudi ambassador. Paul Watson writes, the assassination plot was pushed by a DEA informant. The suspect, our Bob Shear, thought he was involved in a drug deal. This was tied allegedly to the Iranian government as well as Mexican drug cartels, according to Attorney General Eric Holder himself under fire for the Fast and Furious scandal tied to gun walking with Mexican drug gangs. A great, uh, a great smokescreen as they try to flare up for war in the Middle East with Iran. Now we have numerous intelligence officials, people from the intelligence community, who've come forward to warn that there was no good intelligence on this plot, and it looks dubious. FBI insider, Obama administration likely manufactured dubious terror plot. Now you heard on the program today, Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer saying he spoke to an FBI insider who said there was no files linking this plot anywhere inside the Department of Justice files that it was most likely just cooked up for political purposes. You also have Robert Bayer, intelligence official known for the movie Syriana. He wrote a column in Time saying the Iranian plot is nothing more than a bad Hollywood script, that it doesn't match the character of Iran's extremely professional killers, despite the fact they tried to link this Iranian-American used car salesman to the elite Qud force from Iran. Columnist Saman Mohammadi says it's more like a Bollywood script than a Hollywood script. Then you have Ray McGovern, longtime CIA official and former presidential briefer, saying Petraeus's CIA fueled the bad intelligence, allegedly linking this suspect to Iran, saying basically there was no intelligence and that the only hard evidence were recordings of him talking about using a car, selling a car, which they claim was a code word for the assassination plot. All bogus stuff, but of course you have Republican Congressman Peter King and others saying this was an act of war, just gearing up for action in the Middle East with Iran. Let's hope that doesn't happen. Meanwhile, there's more in the Gunwalker scandal, even as Attorney General Eric Holder is about to be subpoenaed to testify. There's the grenade walking scandal within the Gunwalker scandal. I believe we have a clip. CBS News reports that there's a new twist in the government's gunwalking scandal involving an even more dangerous weapon, grenades. And it goes on to explain how the suspect who shipped hundreds and then later thousands of grenade parts to Mexican drug cartels was repeatedly stopped but not prosecuted. One ATF agent even told investigators he literally begged to prosecute the suspect Kingery and keep him in custody, but he was ordered to let Kingery go. In January 2010, ATF had Kingery under surveillance after he bought about 50 grenade bodies and headed to Mexico. But they say prosecutors wouldn't agree to make a case. Six months later, Kingery allegedly got caught leaving the U.S. from Mexico with 114 disassembled grenades in a tire. One ATF agent told investigators he literally begged prosecutors to keep Kingery in custody this time, but was again ordered to let Kingery go. So again, deliberate interference from officials at the Department of Justice, the ATF, and others. Now, Obama and even President Calderon out of Mexico have been on this meme of illegal weapons being shipped to drug cartels since at least August 2009. Then our investigators dug up clips from even earlier in the year 2009 talking about the gun running, gun walking scandal. I heard on the news about this story that uh, Fast and Furious, uh, where uh, allegedly uh, guns were being run into Mexico and ATF knew about it but didn't uh, apprehend those who had, uh, who had sent it. Eric Holder, has, the Attorney General, has been very clear that he knew nothing about this. We've assigned a, 
uh, a, a uh, IG, uh, Inspector General, to investigate it. When did you first know about the program, officially, I believe, called Fast and Furious? To the best of your knowledge, what date? I'm not sure of the exact date, but I probably heard about Fast and Furious for the first time over the last few weeks. So there's Holder originally saying he only knew about the program uh, maybe a few weeks ago, a nebulous, nonspecific term. He's been asked to revise his testimony and admit that he knew about it long before. Now we have a clip coming up of David Ogden, the former Deputy Attorney General, talking about the gun walking project much, much earlier, and there's no way Eric Holder didn't know. DOJ's Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives is increasing its efforts by adding 37 new employees in three new offices using $10 million in Recovery Act funds and redeploying 100 personnel to the southwest border in the next 45 days to fortify its Project Gunrunner, which is aimed at disrupting arms trafficking between the United States and Mexico. ATF is doubling its, its presence in Mexico uh, itself. Um, uh, from five to nine personnel working with the Mexicans specifically to facilitate gun tracing uh, activity which targets uh, the illegal weapons uh, and their sources in the United States. The there they are admittedly using your tax money to ship guns down there just to set up the Second Amendment. Keep in mind that back in March 30th of 2011, Obama met with Jim and Sarah Brady of the Brady Center and commented that he was working under the radar to attack the Second Amendment. So now we see it in action and we're going to continue as this, we're going to continue to watch as this scandal unfolds. Eric Holder certainly under heat, but I would imagine this goes much deeper as well. In other news, the Occupy Wall Street and other Occupy movements across the country have met new resistance as police in various locations have tried to get protesters to move. That effort failed in New York, even though there were several arrests. In Denver, they arrested 24 people, I believe. We have a clip here from that now. Occupy Denver protests clearing out the encampment that has been in place for more than a week now, breaking down tents and within the last half hour arresting protesters. We're back live here at Broadway and Colfax, the Occupy Denver protests. Let me give you a live look right now and update you on where police are at this point. They've managed to push protesters out of the street at Broadway, and now police are lining the curb here, keeping things under control. Michelle, in fact, as you're speaking, we're watching another arrest being made uh, right now from Sky Fox. So the situation clearly still unfolding a lot of tension and you know as Shaw mentioned we're seeing this across the country. Now all these Occupy protesters are a very diverse group. I don't know who these individuals were who were arrested. They really imply that they're blocking the street but I haven't seen any evidence of that. Whatever you think of them though they certainly have a right to protest to be heard even if it is a prolonged protest. So police should really use caution in trying to break up what's going on there because these are people trying to speak for everyone, whether or not they do represent them. Uh, in other angles of the same Occupy Wall Street movement, Michael Chosodovsky has written about Occupy Wall Street and the American Autumn. Is this a colored revolution? We know there's been really the same steering groups behind a number of the color revolutions, first in Serbia, then later the whole Arab Spring thing you saw that started in Egypt and Tahrir Square and moved on to other countries. Uh, now, there's been a lot of talk and investigation and analysis behind that of the foundation groups and even the State Department supporting, sponsoring, and kind of pushing forward the groups that would steer these. So is that going on here in the Occupy Wall Street movement? A good question. And for more on the Occupy movement, we turn now to Rick Warden, who has been occupying the Dallas Federal Reserve for a week now, ever since Alex did a rally there last week. Rick, thank you for joining us, and give us an update, please, on the Occupy movement there in Dallas. We have a handful of strong uh, lovers of liberty who are committed to being at the Occupy, the Fed, Dallas, as often as they can. So we have successfully maintained an occupation. Saturday night, the rally was on Friday, October the 7th. Saturday night, October the 8th, it was a downpour, a gusher came. It rained all night long. It was really nasty and rained most of the day Sunday. So that really put a damper on um, our occupation. 
but uh, we are there holding it and we are going to continue to occupy the Fed here in Dallas. Now they, they continue to have fairly large occupy uh, various cities across the country as part of the other part of that movement. The Federal Reserve movement doesn't have the numbers, but I assure you that presence sends a big message to the authorities in those buildings. Uh, we know Richard Fisher last week was talking about uh, how he sympathizes with the Occupy protesters, how he's trying to help them with jobs, uh, you know, just on the heels of Alex bringing a lot of people to that rally. Now this week he says the Fed's already done all they can do to help with jobs. Uh, so it continues to be up to protesters like you to spotlight the problems the Federal Reserve is causing systematically. That's correct. And what are you going to do? We're just having fun with it. We would like for Richard W. Fisher to just come on down and be the next contestant on the Occupy the Fed Dallas uh, program. We'll get it on video and give him an opportunity to answer openly and honestly uh, some questions for, you know, those people that don't have jobs. Sure. Now, you mentioned before uh, when we were talking, getting ready for this interview, how many of the Occupy Dallas protesters have very similar frames of mind. There's different groups within that group, but many of them have already marched to the Fed. They did so a week ago, even ahead of Alex's rally, and they continue to be part of the subset movement, Occupy the Federal Reserve. That is correct. Uh, they won my heart over for sure. On their first uh, march, they met at JFK Plaza. So, you know, that's a shock to the system right there. You know what I mean? And then their first march was to the Federal Reserve Building in Dallas. With They said their numbers were 1,000 to 1,500. There should be videos on YouTube. So they gave an, a straight shock to the system and went straight for the throat of the beast on their first day here. That's correct. Yeah, now we know the larger Occupy movement, there's been factions on the left trying to co-opt uh, what's going on, but we know many of the people on the ground have their own views. Uh, have, do you have any indicators as to what direction the larger Occupy movement is headed? Well, yes. We watched the video last night with Judge Napolitano where it's a, a letter or a message to Occupy Wall Street where he basically compares the Tea Party uh, and he did a good job recognizing Ron Paul as the originator of the Tea Party and how the Love Revolution had an official Tea Party uh, with Ron Paul present in his district in Lake Jackson. Uh, and so he recognized that and showed how it had been co-opted, compared that to the Occupy movement, and I think sent a real uh, message to the people that do have the same spirit that we have that are in this movement. Sure, yeah. At the higher levels of the hierarchy, we've seen people as high up as Al Gore endorsing, you know, an Arab Spring type movement in the U.S. We know they want to take a lot of that energy and fuel Obama or whoever might be leading the Democratic Party by next year. But uh, there's so much else going on on that movement. And I think it's just very encouraging that they continue to have a presence in cities all across uh, the states, including Dallas. Um, now, what did you think of the rallies themselves for Occupy the Federal Reserve that took place last week? Alex kicked it off uh, in Dallas. There was one in San Antonio, Houston. They've been in other cities across the U.S. as well, uh, notably Boston, where there was uh, thousands of people protesting outside. What kind of signal do you think that sends to the system, Rick? Uh, it's obviously a wonderful shock to the system. Um, we know who we're dealing with. We're dealing with crooks. We're dealing with people that just do not know the concept of being honest and open and fair. And so, um, you know, they've obviously done a fine job of establishing their uh, programs in this society today, but uh, people are waking up. That is obvious. And when you do the types of things that we are doing, occupying the Fed around the nation, Yes. I, I, what to expect from it, I don't really know. But I know that right now, today, we have uh, the attention of the people that we need. Mm -hmm. And we know uh, police across the country in New York City and Denver have begun to move many of the Occupy protesters away from the places they've been. There have been a few arrests across the country. You told me before they plan to relocate the Occupy Dallas movement. 
uh, coming up on Sunday, I believe you said. Has there been any interference at all at the actual Federal Reserve, which, of course, is private property? No, there hasn't. Um, they've been peaceful, and we're, you know, appreciative for that. Uh, we have not asked for their assistance on any of our demonstrations, and we're good with that. They're good with that. Everything's good. Uh, mm -hmm. What happens as this movement continues to grow, we'll see then. But I trust that the movement is a, uh, a right movement, and we have right on our side. So we, we have every reason to be courageous and bold and confident that we're accomplishing uh, wonderful things that are going to be very beneficial. Now, there's been some Ron Paul protests going on in Dallas as well. Uh, could you tell us about that, Rick? Thank you, first off, to Dallas for Ron Paul, the Ron Paul Meetup Group. They've been very warm uh, to the Occupy the Fed Dallas movement. I'd like to see more of them out here, but, you know, that's just how it is. Everybody has jobs and uh, busy lives, so I'm thankful for every person that comes. And I do strongly believe that the Ron Paul supporters are on their way. They're just, I think everybody right now has been waiting for a week to see what's actually going to happen with this movement and see what's going to happen with the Occupy movement. And I think now, uh, thankful, uh, thankfully, to you, Aaron, and Alex Jones, and uh, y'all getting the word out that we are actually there. We have feet on the ground here in Dallas. And so people are coming. I know they are, and we look forward to seeing y'all here. Exactly. And your continued occupation of the Dallas Federal Reserve really puts a spotlight on the true root cause of the systematic economic problems that we face that all these movements are trying to address uh, in one way or another. And, of course, we need more people to come down there. The Ron Paul factions have been protesting the Federal Reserve since at least 2007. I think that, too, sends a great signal. And we just hope more people will join you there in Dallas or at Federal Reserves all across the country. Thanks so much, Rick Warden. Continue to occupy, please. And we'll be back after this break with more on the InfoWars Night. Back from break, again, I'm Aaron Dyke sitting in for Alex. He's still doing the radio show, and he'll be back next week. Now, I just want to put in a quick reminder that on November 3rd, we're going to have another money bomb. We are not corporate supported. We depend on your support and your subscriptions at prisonplanet.tv and through special outreaches like the November 3rd money bomb. Now, in other news, the FBI has admitted and really promoted that it's recording talk radio, including callers and everything. So, Kurt Nemo writes, if you call into the Alex Jones Show or hundreds of other talk radio stations that maintain a web presence, there's a good chance the FBI will record you. Well, that's a no-brainer. They're just obviously putting this out as an intimidation tactic. You've heard about the Missouri Information Analysis Center and Homeland Security targeting the right-wing extremists and, and other radical groups. They're really just trying to institute an overall chilling on free speech, trying to make people feel uncomfortable speaking out. Just ridiculous. Also, Kurt Nemo writes, House bill would criminalize satire of TSA. This is in regards to Bill H.R. 3011, introduced in the House, entitled Transportation Security Administration Authorization Act of 2011, with curious language about colorable imitation or such words, initials, and likeness of the Transportation Security Administration or various federal air marshal services, the use of the insignia or badge on apparel or in connection with advertisements, books, software, and other publications. And what they're really talking about is if you attempt to portray yourself as representing the official legal entity of the TSA, uh, but at the same time, we know there has been, like I said, a chilling on free speech, and they may use this kind of bill to target satire as well, to put people on the defensive, that they need to put a disclaimer that they don't officially represent the TSA. Of course you have a right to satire, to parody, or to even just show official photos. The TSA has already tried to intimidate you out of filming at checkpoints, intimidate you out of showing uh, press release photos and reporting on them, and this is just another step in that direction. It's already illegal to impersonate a law enforcement official or other authority, so this is really an unnecessary move, but here it is anyway. Now, we're going to take you to 
two interviews on the fluoride subject. We have an in-studio guest coming up at the end of the broadcast, Laura Presley, Ph.D., on some of the tactics of removing fluoride. And before that, Tony Casso, who successfully lobbied Pinellas County to remove the fluoride. But first, we want to talk about New Plymouth in New Zealand, where they just agreed to remove fluoride yesterday, October 13th. Today, New Plymouth District Council decided to stop fluoridating the water supply for the New Plymouth area. And again, towns everywhere are starting to wise up that there's no good science to water fluoridation. That's, in fact, very dangerous, and it's not right to mass medicate people. In fact, the Water Authority for Great Neck North, which is in the Long Island area of New York, has for many years admitted that fluoridation of community water is no longer considered a priority or even desirable, even, in, even despite the fact that the CDC has called it one of their 10 greatest achievements in the 20th century. Uh, now, more on that Pinellas County Commission vote to stop putting fluoride in the water supply. That happened back on October 5th, and we are again going to be talking with Tony Casso. He's quoted in this article as saying, fluoride is a toxic substance. He's called a Tea Party activist. He's really just an activist. This is all part of an agenda that's being pushed forth by the so-called globalists in our government and the world government to keep the people stupid so they don't realize what's going on, adding this is the U.S. of A., not the Soviet Socialist Republic. And, of course, that's true. If anything, fluoride decisions should be made locally, not pushed from the top down using various funding mechanisms to make it seem mandatory. For more on the removal of fluoride in Pinellas County, we turn now to Tony Casso, one of the men who helped get fluoride removed from the water supply there. Tony, thanks for joining us. Uh, what can you tell us about how this process happened? They took a consensus back in 2003, right, to put the fluoride in, which was really not a vote of the public. And we've been against this from the beginning. And it actually emulated as being part of the budget process in our county. They were looking for ways to cut money, right? Because they were evidently right, not balancing the budget. And this came up as an item, and it left us an opening to go after it. Well, sure, that's an issue in all these towns. We had to pay to essentially poison ourselves. Exactly. And even though it's not a very large budget item, it's still a savings to the citizens of the county. Pinellas County, what are the major cities in that area? How big of an area does this cover? Well, it's one of the largest, or if not the largest county in Florida population-wise. There's close to a million people living in Pinellas County, right? We're due west of Tampa, right? Uh, the city of Clearwater is part of Pinellas County. So is St. Petersburg, Tarpon Springs, and it's pretty much your northern boundary to your southern boundary of the county, right? We're not the largest in landmass, but we're one of the largest in population. And what did you mean by the quote in the article when you talk about the globalists pushing for the fluoridation as part of their larger agenda? Can you clarify those statements? Well, as far as the globalist part goes, right, I've also been fighting UN Agenda 21. Now, I know a lot of people think it's a conspiracy theory, but it's not. It's real and it's here. Right. When we speak about it, they just say we're a bunch of nut jobs, right? But if people get on their computers and do the research, right, that it, they'll see that it, the UN Agenda 21 is involved in every part of local government and every one of the programs that they're doing is related to UN Agenda 21 on the local level. Well, sure, it's not even real fluoride, and that's always been one of the larger issues, is that they sell this as a medical health benefit, but why would you take it internally and part of all foods, so that's in foods at restaurants, foods everywhere, part of food preparation and the water you drink and drinks you buy from stores. I mean, that's really the larger issue we're trying to fight here, isn't it? We're not asking them to remove the natural fluoride. 
We just don't want them adding a toxic substance to create fluoride or what they call fluoride into our water system. Right? And I don't know if they have a license to medicate us. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, it's forced mass medication. Now, the larger national issue here is that for years they told us you can't remove fluoride. It's been trickling in everywhere. It only came into Pinellas County, I believe, in 2004. Uh, but now there's a larger movement across the country of people fighting to get it removed. And we've had a lot of victories. There's been at least 250 cities where the fluoride has been removed. This was a major victory in Pinellas County. What can you tell people out there who haven't been able to remove the fluoride yet from their cities? but uh, are looking to fight and win that battle? Well, to fight it, you have, to, what the people have to do is get every piece of information there is on the fluoride. Send it to your county commissioners. Send it by email, it goes into the public record. Right? There's a lot of good information on the internet. You got the Fluoride Action Network, right? You can take them right from the EPA and CDC reports. Because if you actually read them, they tell you in there how bad it is. Unfortunately, most people only read the first two pages and they don't go any further. That's right. All these government agencies have had to admit how dangerous it is and have had to recommend, even openly, to lower the amount of fluoride, if not remove it. Now tell us, did you appeal to the county commissioners individually in the town? Did you educate them? Or did you get a mass number of people to show up at these meetings? What, what was key to the victory in Pinellas County? Well, it, it was a combination effort. The combination effort was to start, as soon as they came up with reducing the budget, right, we started bombarding them with every piece of information out there that we had on the fluoride issue. Plus, we do attend every county commission meeting. And every chance we had to speak up against it, we did. Until we got through to a couple of the commissioners that were up there that actually ended up understanding what the issue was and they brought it up. And by them bringing it up, right, of course it invited the ones that were for fluoride into it, which was the ADA. But the ADA has no credible evidence that this even works. Tony Casso of PinellasPatriots.org, we thank you for your action and the victory you had. We want other people to take action wherever they are because they too will start to have victories. Tony Casso of PinellasPatriots.org, thank you for your fight. You had a victory. Now others who t take, ugh, let's just do that again. Right, yeah. I remember we're going to break. Yeah, okay. Tony Casso of PinellasPatriots.org, you had a victory. Put up against the council. Thank you for your fight, and we ask others to fight out there. We're going to be back from break in just a moment with Laura Presley, Ph.D., more on the fluoride battle, where we are beginning to have many victories across the country. Stay tuned. We are back from break, and I just want to remind you that we rely on subscriber support. Please consider supporting the InfoWars nightly news at PrisonPlanet.tv. Now, we just spoke with Tony Casso, who got the fluoride removed from Pinellas County, and, of course, one of the main selling points was the budget cost that it that it takes to put fluoride in the water. Uh, we have back with us Laura Presley, Ph.D. Uh, she was on two weeks ago talking about the move here in Austin to get fluoride removed, and that is ongoing now. Thanks for joining us again, Laura. Thanks for having us again, Aaron. Thank you. Yeah. Now, uh, I know some of the updates. They've been removing fluoride all across the country and across the Western world. Uh, there's parts of New Zealand that just recently removed the water from their area. And... Yeah, so New Zealand is a place that Dr. Paul Connett, um, which you guys have had multiple times here um, on InfoWars, he works directly with them, and I'm sure he is incredibly happy about this news. So we're all happy about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the trend really is turning, and there's been a number of political groups that have come forward, too. 
who are now against fluoride. Uh, let's talk about some of those groups. Yes, um, one of the biggest ones is LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens. And this is a national um, organization and a national resolution that they came, uh, that they passed. And what's phenomenal about this is they called a spade a spade and they said fluorid fluoridation is mass medication and that they do not approve of this. And they actually demanded to know why cities want to protect the policy of fluoridation over and above protecting the health of their citizens of their counties and their cities. And so they were very blunt and did not mince words and it was a very strong uh, resolution against fluoridation. The American Dental Association has come out and put a lot of pressure on LULAC and mm. initially they took off the resolution from their website. It was about a week while a lot of discussions were being had with the American Dental Association and LULAC leadership. And so the resolution is back up now, and they said we are not going to rescind this resolution, even uh, under the incredible pressure the American Dental Association put on them. Yeah, that's very positive. Yeah, it was. Course, we were very happy. Minority organizations, there's so many people concentrated in cities, and it costs a lot of money to get out from under the, the whole paradigm of water fluoridation. You have to research and then spend a lot of money yes. to extract yourself from that. Yes, and the CDC in 2002 came out with a study and documented that African Americans and Hispanics actually are affected by fluoridation, by fluorosis, mm -hmm. um, two to three X higher than Caucasians. So that is one of the reasons LULAC made this step. They know that their people are being affected disproportionately on the negative side. And um, and they did reference that in the resolution, and we are we are very just yeah. very proud of them. We've also had political people uh, such as Ralph Nader on the left and Ron Paul uh, on the GOP side of things also speaking out against fluoride. Absolutely, Dr. Ron Paul and Ralph Nader, and then also in Atlanta, there's been a lot of pressure um, in um, Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin Luther King's family, his sister Bernice, and uh, other members of his family. And Andrew Young, who was the mayor of Atlanta, have come out against fluoridation again because it affects African Americans disproportionately on the negative side. Yeah. And you know we're very impressed and proud and the, at their bravery and their courage for coming out and speaking against this. Yeah, those are all positive signs. Of course, we know so much about all the negative effects that are associated with fluoride. Uh, there's been lawsuits about the fluoridation, yes. uh, the fluorosis rather. And, uh, but the real reason we have you here is to talk about some of the steps of how to fight it in your area, wherever that area might be. Right. Uh, so let's cover some of that. Okay. Um, we have, uh, the way we've approached it with Fluoride Free Austin, initially we approached it with the scientific data. Mm -hmm. You have to have the science behind you whenever you want to make a change. Um, and so we presented to our city council and about the dental mechanism that fluoride really just works topically on the teeth and then also the negative health effects of dental fluorosis that's 40 percent in teenagers right now hypothyroidism bone disease in children adhd and add increases in iq reductions in children and basically the bottom line is because there's no dose control for this chemical there's no dose control for age weight size and sensitivity you have all of those effects that I just mentioned above, the dental fluorosis, the hypothyroidism, all of those are a consequence because people are more sensitive than others. And um, so that is a, you know, that's the scientific data that everybody needs to be aware of. And that is, all of this information has come out in the last probably 10 years. And if, so in Austin, that scientific information has not allowed the city council to make a move and get rid of fluoride. So we have gone now to step two. We're putting a lot of political pressure on the council. And this, these are steps that anybody across the country, across the world can take. Um, we started writing letters to council members and the mayor. We've requested public hearings. We've had multiple public hearings. We just build support when do doctors and, and scientists and um, dentists, you know, come and say this is an, an incredible health uh, danger to uh, to people. So that is where we are in Austin right now. We are looking at the political pressure on the council. And then the last thing that 
some cities have done, mm -hmm. last resort is a lawsuit. And, of course, that's on the table for anybody that any uh, county or city that wants to pursue that. There are a lot of legal, I guess, claims that are made and that are valid. The, this fluoride is not a drug yeah. uh, by the FDA. It is, um, there's no informed consent, okay? And it's deceptive trade because there's deceptive trade practice because there's no, there, it's not considered a drug. So those are the legal approaches that have happened. And um, the last thing that we want to do in Austin, and I would, I would recommend this, and Dr. Conant also says this um, as he gives us advice, that as a public referendum is one of the last things or the thing you do not want to do. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is the American Dental Association comes out and puts a lot of money into misinformation and disinformation about fluoride and fluoridation. And so it really overwhelms any kind of grassroots effort. You know, it's very difficult for citizens to raise, you know, $50,000, $100,000 in a public ad campaign that the ADA can come in and do automatically. So yeah. that's the last thing we want to do. And, of course, that's one of the major barriers to lawsuits, too, because there's no other reason to wait on lawsuits. It, it affects yeah, everyone. It. That's right. Mass medication. Can we talk about some of the high-profile lawsuits that have been going on? You mentioned yes. Florida. I'm sorry, Maryland and California. Yes, the Florida lawsuit's a personal injury lawsuit. There's a woman who um, is suing um, the uh, the state. I'm not, well, I'm not sure what city she's in. Yeah. Suing for her daughter who has severe fluorosis. And apparently when the child was, was very young, she just gave her 90% of her diet was fluoridated water because she was trusting what the government was telling her, what the CDC was telling her, what dentists were telling her. Um, and so the, the daughter now has severe fluorosis. She's a teenager, and it will cost about $100,000 to repair all the damage of her teeth, and they cannot bear that burden. So she is suing um, the state of Maryland. Um, the second lawsuit is a, is a really big one and one that we are watching very carefully. It's in ca Southern California, the Southern California Water District that services Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, San Diego. And they are suing, as, as we just talked about, for deceptive trade practice because this fluoride, fluoride is not a drug. Mm. It's being claimed it's a drug used for dental, um, prevent a dental disease. It's being used as a drug even though it's not. And um, it's, there's no informed consent and they're really claiming unconstitutional, um, uh, constitutional violations of the people. And so we're watching that very carefully because that's a very large water district. And um, so we, we hope they're successful. We're yeah. pretty confident they will be. Yeah, of course, it strikes right at the nerve of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Absolutely. So. It's right up there. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so here locally, there's a big meeting coming up this Tuesday. That's October 18th, correct? Yes, October 18th, Tuesday at 3 o'clock p.m. There's Austin City Council Public Health and Human Services subcommittee meeting. And we want people to be there at 2.30 to sign up to speak. Fluoride Free Austin has a number of people, doctors, dentists, acupuncturists, um, as scientists and chiropractors and citizens, mothers, families that are going to be speaking and to in, try to influence and push hard the Public Health and Human Services Committee to put a warning on our water bill about fluoridation. Mm -hmm. And we have specific wording. The wording that we've chosen is very what I would call middle of the ground wording. It is actually language directly from the CDC language directly from the material safety data sheet of the supplier of the chemical that Austin uses and direct wording from Austin City Council's own website about fluoride. So we are not making anything up. This is very middle ground, um, basic warning that we want on the water bill. Yeah, of course, it's important for individuals to get informed and educate others about all these dangers. But there's been so many government agencies who have had to admit those dangers. And still we have stuff like... Uh, cities that won't remove it. We have here an interesting piece of propaganda. Everyone needs fluoride. Yes, and there is almost zero fluoride in mother's milk. So I guess mm. babies are not included in this. <laughs> Why are so many of these dental groups so committed to uh, the fluoride issue? What's behind that? You know, that's a very good question, and it's a hard question. There's a lot of, a lot of theories. You know, Dr. Conant says that fluoridation is kind of one of the holy grails of the CDC. If they back off of fluoridation, they will lose a lot of credibility and mm -hmm. lose a lot of face with the public. And, you know, what's next on the agenda for uh, being critical of? It's vaccinations for the yeah. CDC. So I think 
And this is Dr. Conant's theory. I think it makes a lot of sense that they're protecting fluoridation, ultimately trying to protect their, um, their credibility and vaccination, the policy of vaccination. So that's, that's one of the, the theories that's out there. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It's horrible. And, you know, also I think there's so much new information, new scientific information that's come out in the last 10 years. These dentists need to go look at the information and get educated. Um, there was one of our, our uh, Fluoride Free Austin members that w she was at a party with Mayor Lee Leffingwell mm -hmm. of Austin. And he says, oh, you know, I, I, I want to keep fluoride in our water. My dentist says it's okay. And her comment to him was, your dentist needs to be educated. Yeah. Okay, and that's the truth. These dentists who, who do not understand the chemistry of fluoride, who don't understand and have not looked at the recent information and data that's out there in peer-reviewed journals, they need to get up to speed and start communicating to their patients what the truth is. Yeah. So, of course, we want to look at the strategies that worked. And, again, we just spoke with Tony Casso from Pinellas County in Florida. And, again, the way he finally sold city council on removing fluoride was the budgetary issue. How much do they spend here in Austin, and what's kind of the average cost for major cities? Yeah, so Austin it depends on the population because it's a, a volume um, kind mm. of extrapolation. Austin spends five hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars a year on fluoride for seven hundred thousand people. So maybe it's a dollar per person, something like that. Um, it's probably little. It's probably less than that. But I think College Station also uh, population of a hundred thousand people. Mm. They initially wanted fluoride out of their water supply based on budgetary issues. It got put back on the agenda because of concerns from dentists, and there was a lot of debate and conversation about uh, what to do with the fluoride in the College Station. The council members themselves went and did their research and said, oh, there's too many health issues. Let's keep continue this and keep it out. Yeah, but of course, yeah. when they're cutting budgets, they're cutting jobs, people's benefits. We don't need fluoride to be a sacred cow. And all they have to do is turn off the tap. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, so tell us about your website, and thanks for joining us. Sure. Uh, FluoridefreeAustin.com, and there's a lot of information on there uh, that other cities or counties that want information on the health benefits and um, uh, removing fluoride. And we've got a lot of information there. Dr. Paul Conant's book, the, uh, the Case Against Fluoride is a phenomenal resource. Mm -hmm. And um, so our website, fluoridefreeaustin.com, and Dr. Conant's book will prepare anybody to tackle their city council. Great. Yes. Yeah, thanks so much Thank for you. joining thanks us. Thanks for having us. And everyone get active out there. That's it for the InfoWars Nightly News. Again, we rely on your subscriber support, so please help us out. Please help us to grow this broadcast and educate people on so many different issues. We'll be back next Monday. Thank you. Good night.